Mandalorian is back. The adventures of Grogu and Mando have returned. And although I really enjoyed parts of the first episode, as I'm sure you did, I also found a lot of it really confusing, completely confusing. Like I have no idea what's going on or why Mando is doing what he's doing. Today, I'm gonna break down parts of the episode, go over the things I think really worked, the stuff I think really failed. And I'd also love to hear your opinion on episode one of season three. Let me know in the comments. Let's do it. Hey everyone, it's Andrew. <laughs> if you're new, please subscribe so I can keep affording my Disney Plus subscription. That would be wonderful, thank you. Let's first talk about the good stuff. I really love that they introduce more of the Mandalorian backstory and we're seeing more of the Mandalorian's actual world. It seems as though more members of the tribe have come together. The armorer is building a new helmet for a new initiate, which is something we've never seen, something we've only really seen referenced. It's interesting because every single Mandalorian, whether they be of the tribe or not, have had a ceremony like this performed where they are given their helmet. The same happened for Jango Fett. He was introduced by Justin Muriel. Same happened for Boba Fett, although in a different way. The first time he put on his helmet was likely after his father's death. At first, I think a lot of us thought this ceremony could be a flashback to when Din was initiated, even though he spoke of it being different. And I guess we did see flashbacks of him as a child and he doesn't look like this kid. But at the same time, you know, my memory's a little hazy on that stuff. It's been a while. I don't know if you guys felt this, but when the giant crocodile beast thing came out of the lake and started attacking all the Mandalorians, for some reason, I felt like this turned into an episode of the Power Rangers. Like suddenly they're all just attacking this giant monster, all the different colors. At the end of the day, Mandalorians are supposed to be super troopers. That's kind of what they were. That's kind of what George Lucas's original idea of Boba Fett being. He's a bounty hunter that was kind of more impressive than other bounty hunters, I guess you could say. And we're seeing this completely fulfilled here. I did find it funny that the armorer is literally walking up to this giant beast just with her hammer and is about to take a swig before she, like, what did you think was going to happen? Falls over in the water. All right. Even though this was a totally epic entrance for Din Djarin to come in and save the day with Grogu, what is with Star Wars' obsession with killing beasts and animals? I mean, this is how season two's first episode started as well. They killed the giant freight dragon in the Tatooine Desert. Now they're doing the same thing here. Just like, oh yeah, by the way, <laughs> we need to get rid of native giant animals. Okay, the next scene after the opening credits is where things for me got really confusing because I thought they've already had this conversation. The armorer has already told Din Djarin that he is no longer worthy because he removed his helmet, that he is no longer a Mandalorian, and that the only way he can can redeem himself is if he travels to Mandalore. So why are they again having this same conversation? Why has Mando even returned to the armorer, to the tribe, to reconnect with them? I don't really understand what the purpose of this was. He's got Grogu back. That's kind of all that's changed. Last time they had this conversation, they're on that weird kind of underground space world that was in the Book of Boba Fett. So is this scene literally just for people who didn't watch the Book of Boba Fett? Because not a lot of people didn't. I know there are a lot of people coming to this. This is the other thing I found really strange about this episode. Now, I know a lot of you probably know way more about Star Wars than I do, but I have run a YouTube channel all about Star Wars for the past five, six, seven years. So generally speaking, I know more about Star Wars than I guess the average fan. The Mandalorian is a show for the average Star Wars fan. It's a show that's targeted at the widest Star Wars audience possible. So if I'm having trouble following this show and understanding why the Mandalorian is doing all these things, more of which I'll get to in a second, then I can't imagine what it's like for someone who just comes in and out of Star Wars and doesn't spend every single day talking about it. That said, Din Djarin does bring the armorer, this crystal from the surface of Mandalore, as evidence that you can, in fact, travel to Mandalore. But I still don't understand why he needs to show her this. Why not just go there and prove that you've redeemed yourself? Also, how does he get evidence that he's done so? Does he have to take like video footage of that or do they just believe him? Do they just, he could just lie his way back into the creed, couldn't he? Just be like, oh yeah, I went to Mandalore, it was fine. I, d I went for a swim in the bars and uh, can I have my Mandalorian status back? Does anyone else find that? <laughs> confusing. Small detail, I really love that Grogu can go from his little hatch in Mando's ship into Mando's lap. Really cute. <laughs> For a long time, I was like, hey, wait, he's stuck back there. I'm glad they actually explained that. That You see, this is a good small detail that is worth explaining. When Mando's new ship was revealed, I was like, that's an awesome ship, but does he have to put Grogu in that thing and he's he just stuck in there? And now they've actually shown, no, he can actually go between, but it's genius, beautiful. Thank you for showing us that as part of the canon. That makes things so much better. I also really love what they've done with Navarro. The fact that this world is now thriving, Grief Karga is in charge and seems to have really brought this place up from the ground. It used to be quite a Western town 
which in some ways it still is. I mean, Pirates came up and we still had a classic Clint Eastwood moment, but at the same time, things have really picked up around here. You can really see the galaxy is changing, especially after the reign of the Empire. Certain parts of the galaxy are experiencing freedom and liberation. I also really like how we had just one line explaining what happened to Cara Dune, that she was recruited by special forces. Gina Carano, who plays Cara Dune, was infamously fired from The Mandalorian after making some comments on Twitter. Interesting that they didn't kill her off though. She does still exist somewhere in the galaxy and will likely never be referenced or mentioned ever again. Okay, here's another thing. IG-11 was obliterated. From the scene we saw in The Mandalorian Season 1, it looks like there would have been very little of him left, but here you can see most of his structure still remains, especially his internal electronics, which Mando is fixing in this scene. So don't you guys think all of this would have been fried when he self-destructed? I mean, how, how much is possibly still inside? How much is still possibly intact? And now Mando wants his old friend back. So Grief Karga introduces Mando to the Anzellans, who are notoriously good at fixing droids, but they need a specific part, memory circuit, I believe, which Mando then offers to find. However, Grief Karga tells Mando that if the Anzellans can't find it, then he likely won't be able to, but still Mando is like, nah, nah, I'm going to find this thing. And then he leaves, right? But then instead of actually going to look for whatever this piece is, he travels to a new planet, Kalevala, and goes to meet Bo-Katan, who is just sitting here all alone. Okay, first of all, I don't understand why Mando's going here at this point. Wouldn't you think he's actually going to go look for the part that he needs to revive IG so that he can then return to Mandalore to redeem himself and complete his overarching quest that seems like it's going to make up the bulk of season three. Instead, he travels here, meets up with Bo-Katan, who's sitting lonely in this castle all on her own. <laughs> What's she doing here? Like, seriously, what's she doing in this chair? She's just chilling, waiting for people to come visit. Just being like, okay, maybe today's the day. This is how she's sitting. She's sitting like this in a chair. Maybe today is the day they will come visit. Maybe today is the day that cute Mandalorian I secretly have a crush on is finally going to come visit me. But when he comes, I'm not going to be excited to see him. I'm just going to ask about his dark saber. Is that what's going to happen? That's what happened. What's she doing here? Why is she waiting? Seriously. <laughs> It's funny. Is there anyone else here apart from the droid? Is she just chilling here on her own? Is she the only Mandalorian on this planet? What's going on? The Mandalorian castle, she's sitting here all on her own. She says all the other Mandos have gone off and become mercenaries and raiding other places and doing other things. And she still wants the Darksaber. Is she going to become a villain? I don't know. I don't. I have no idea what's going to happen. My forces melted away is exactly what she says, guys. She's obsessed with this Saber Man. I understand why. It makes total sense. But at the same time, it's like, maybe you should find yourself a new mission, a new objective. Maybe there's not all to Mandalore than you thought there was. You know, maybe it's time to look for a new career path. She has skills, she has assets. She'd be wanted in certain parts of the galaxy. Anyway, Mando still wants to go for a bath in the living waters of Mandalore. And Bo-Katan tells Mando that these waters are beneath the civic center in the city of Sunduri. So Mando's traveled here to learn of where he can go for a bath, basically. So I guess my question around this is, why has he traveled all the way, the Mandalorian system, if he doesn't have the droid repaired yet, just to learn of where he can go for a bath once he eventually gets to Mandalore? Like I said, I really enjoyed parts of this episode. Thought it was a lot of fun. I think there's a lot more fun that we're going to get. I think a lot more is going to happen, but I also think it's the weakest opening episode of The Mandalorian's three seasons. Season one was super exciting because it was the introduction of The Mandalorian and everything he was about as a bounty hunter. And of course, eventually we get the reveal of Grogu. Season two, we got to meet the Marshal Cobb Vanth, who of course had Boba Fett's armor. Season three here, a little bit underwhelming, but of course there's going to be a lot more to it. I'm just kind of a little bit confused by Mando's motivations in this episode. Why is he going where he's going and why is he doing what he's doing in this order? Can someone please explain it to me? Because if I don't get it, I'm sure one of you do. Let me know your thoughts about this episode in the comments below. Let me know if you want to see more of these. And if you like prequel memes, I really recommend watching this video here. Maybe I should do a Mandalorian meme episode. That'd be great. And thanks for watching this. My name's Andrew. I'll catch you soon.